Oh, I will. I will make the I will make yesterday's recording available uh, for everybody today. I was just uh, double checking if we have access to the recordings of the breakout rooms. I don't think we have, unfortunately, but we have the prior and posterior discussion. So I will make that available for the people that want to try the exercise by themselves. So questions so far? We are at the third day today. So we are getting experts in junior language, which is great. <laughs> So um, something that I would like to remind everybody about our GitHub, uh, how you can submit your answers and trials and discussions to the repository. Uh, I will go there to open. Um, uh, I think go here. Oops. Okay. Introduction. Gl. If you go to the repository, I've opened a tab called discussion. And everybody has access to it and can post their discussions, answers. I see that Aditra posted uh, their solution for the stoichiometry calculator, which is very nice. So if you want to ask questions besides the issues, you can go to the discussions to post code and comment on and comment on others code. I hope we can get a Julia, a small Julia community out of Latinx game. Uh, so we can keep our discussions here and post code about the mini game in the first class. There is also a discussion session here. So everybody's welcome to post. About the issues, we had some issues open about configurations and how to integrate Julia and Jupyter into VS Code, uh, and we could get that solved. So every time you go to open an issue, take a look at the closed issues to see if your configuration uh, problem or your question was already answered. Uh, if it not if it was not clear to you, you can always go to the issue and leave a comment, and we can reopen the issue uh, for that specific thing. Um, so those are the announcements, I think. And today we will do a lot of interesting stuff. We will start with inline notations and math notations in Julia. And then we will go to vectorization, logical operations, uh, matrices, and we will go to the plots uh, library, which is very cool. We will start using Julia on things that we can do in our day-to-day -day research, like plotting figures. You can do this plots library for to prepare your posters for Latin game, for another conferences. So it's quite interesting, it's cool. And we will play around with these plots using the particle in a box model, uh, which I really like. So I'm biased about this one. <laughs> because I, I think most of the quantum chemists here love the particle in a box model. 
So we will play a little bit with that. And after that, we'll be running a microkinetic simulation using Catalyst. Let me see the, the comment. Yeah. Um, we will use catalyst.jl, uh, another package implemented in Julia, to perform microkinetic simulations and define reaction networks. And we will use a Mikhail Ismantin example uh, to run this and have the reaction profile with the concentration over time. So we will use the Mikhail Ismantin to solve the rate law for for using Julia for this reaction. So yeah, a lot of good stuff today. I hope everybody could update their notebooks. I'm always posting and uploading more stuff in the repository. And my intention is to keep updating this uh, with time, so we will have a robust structure to learn Julia. This is just the primary initiative, but I will be continuously uploading even after the, the course. Every time I find new examples, new stuff. So you can always take a look if you want to practice Julia. Okay, let's go back to coding. Uh, if you remember, uh, in our first discussion, I showed everybody how to create functions in in Julia, uh, and I will give a quick reminder. If you are a Pythonist, or if you have learned Python, you know that in Python, to define a function, you do this: def and then name of function and then args and then two points and then that's it for Python, right? And you need to make the indentation. For Julia, the special word is function. So we define function. Let's define the function f. And this function sums up two to the argument. The structure of this function x is an argument and you can have as many arguments as you want or need. You have this argument being operated inside the function. And why using functions is important. For example, if you have, um, if you need to perform this x plus two, a lot of times during your code, you can isolate that in a function and you just call the function every time you need to do that same operations in your implementation or algorithm. Something interesting about these functions, you can return a y like you have in mathematics. So return y. Great, you define the function. You don't need this indentation as you do in Python. I always compare with Python because Python is very popular and a lot of people start programming by using Python. Um, so we suggest the indentation for organization and formatting uh, matters, but you don't need to. But in Python, if you don't have the indentation, your function won't run. But instead of defining all this structure to have a function, Julia also allows you to have expressions and have inline notations of mathematical functions. 
And this is quite useful for numerical programming, uh, even for machine learning. When we practice much machine learning, uh, I think not tomorrow, but in the last day on Friday, we will be practicing machine learning. Um, and then we will be using more of these expressions. That's why I'm I'm showing that. You can just write f of x, putting inside of the parentheses, and then do this x plus two. And then if you call f of two, you will have the result four. Quite simple. Another cool thing about Julia, uh, Julia supports Unicode. So you can have these Greek letters in your code. And the way you do this is quite simple. You put the sidebar in alpha, for example, and then you have alpha. Uh, same for beta. Oops. You don't use the auto completion because yes, otherwise you you would just have the the name and not the symbol. You have this. You have alpha better, and you can do the following. You can have a. powered, and then for this, or you have underscore actually, A2, you have A underscore two. You can also have that as a variable. So Julia allows a very flexible no notation, which makes your code more readable and and also more organized if you are writing code for mathematics even for quantum mechanics um it's quite quite useful i will i will show a particular implementation of of this that i really like okay i like okay, it's my package but that's why i like <laughs> If you go to my GitHub, let me put the, the link in the in the chat. So yes. Uh here. Oops. I hate this zoom thing that keeps showing up. Yes. If you go here and open um, this package, by the way, this package is a quantum, a cute logo, <laughs> is a quantum chemistry package to calculate molecular integrals for overlap kinetic, electron nuclear attraction and electron electron repulsion. So when you go here for the two electron integral, the most expensive one, you will see that there is a lot of Greek letters and mathematical notations. So it makes very uh, easy to read and to implement those things. I like to show real case and where this is used because sometimes people don't, oh, okay, this is just a uh, notation, but notation is quite useful for specific things. Um, that's why we have, for example, different representation of chemical structures. Each one is important for its specific application. If it's a string representation of molecules, you use for chemoinformatics, for example. It's a, if it is a three-dimensional, like XYZ files, 
PDB for proteins. You use that in a bunch of softwares to simulate, calculate properties because for the algorithms implemented for molecular dynamics, for electronic structure calculations, you need the coordinates, you need the positions in the space. So that's the perfect representation for that case. But for chemoinformatics, you use just strings uh, to write in the paper or to teach. Sometimes you use the chemical formula. Uh, in a talk, you use the molecular names. It, does, uh, it doesn't make sense, for example, if I'm talking about butter, uh, continuously, continuously mentioned eight, two, oh, no, I will say water. So each representation and each notation uh, has its own space. Um, and now let's mix Greek letters with inline notations. Let's define the summation function. I can define by a uh, capital sigma, as we do in with pen and paper when we are doing mathematics. Uh, so you can let me show how to do that. You sigma this. Yes, you have the summation. That's great. And you can have the product function as well, defined by a capital Phi. Now let's practice. Uh, remember, uh, you can define a list in Julia using this. So you define a list from one to five. You can also define the list automatically, like you can compute the list. Values, you open the brackets and you have, you have I for I in the range one to five. Julia is always one index, so you can start with one. You could start with zero here because you are like adding numbers to the list. But it's important to mention that Julia is one indexed. Let's show what this means. If I do values element zero, it doesn't exist. So you will have a bounce error. When you see this bounce error, you know what it means you are indexing or you are calling the wrong index in a data structure. So if I call values one and I run, I have the number one because the first element in this five element vector formed by integers is one. So the, the idea here is to show not only how to read Julia code, but how to read the Julia error. Usually you, the first message in the, is the one that most matters for you. So now let's sum up the values in the list. You can give this list as an argument for the summation function and you have this 15 and you can also give as an argument for the product fun function and you have 120 so yeah that's quite useful uh questions so far you can put in the chat you can open your microphone if you want to show something, show an, uh, an interesting example or application you've thought about. I can, you can also share your screen. Don't be ashamed. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, don't forget, to interrupt me if you need, if you want. Okay, 
Now let's continue talking about vectors and matrices in Julia. Uh, you can do many, many, many things in Julia using vectors and matrices. Julia is optimized for linear algebra and numerical computing. And remember, in quantum chemistry, everything, and in machine learning, everything is about matrices. So all of these algorithms, you are basically multiplying or forming matrices. So you are basically manipulating these structures, these vectors, and these matrices. I will show you how I'm, I'm calling vectors and matrices because there's a difference in Julia for these two uh, types of data structure. So remember how you define inside of brackets. Okay, you have this and you can sum up the, the two vectors and form a new one. So you have the vector A with one, two, three and the vector B with four, five and six. And you form the vector C summing up A and B. Okay, that's easy. But uh, let's suppose we have J for J in one up to seven and B And B is K for K in one up to eight. So let me bring it one at a time. Okay. So what's the size of A? Seven. What's the size of B? Eight. If you try to sum up, you will have a dimension mismatch because, oh, I see things in the. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, so Aritra is telling Jordania to do git pull. You can do git pull or you can download the zip from the GitHub uh, repository. If you need the link again, I can, yes, or you can git clone fresh. Exactly. Thanks Aritra to, for helping Jordania. Let me know if there are more issues with that. Uh, you have this dimension mismatch. If you try to sum up vectors, they are from different sizes. This is expected, but don't be scared. Sometimes you are folding too fast or you are doing stuff and you forget that the dimensions are different. So when you see this error, you know what it's talking about. Um, okay, so when you do this, summation, you have this. You can also do, no, you need to do the multiplication and matrices. I will show later. You can also do subtraction in this, uh, with these vectors and you form a new vector with integers. If you have different types, you still can do it. So you can have different types inside vectors because these vectors, let me, this is interesting because we love typing, dynamic typing. We are always looking at the types of the variables. Let's look at the type of A. So A is a vector formed by, Flows. 
because we have this first element as a float number and because of the data hierarchy it transforms all the elements in a as floats and then your product your c is also formed by floats if you are used to python um naming and typing you know that python calls those vectors arrays so you can also call them arrays but for simplicity we call them vectors let me see the chat okay great seems that jordania could solve the issue now one of the most fundamental things in programming and in science it's logic let's play a little bit with logic i don't know if you learned that in college or high school or in the university but basically when we have logical statements like a and b when you operate over them using and using or using implications like in real life when you say i like oranges and apples you you say you like both oranges and apples uh the same for logical operations because you are saying that if a statement a is zero and a statement b is zero so a and b should be zero it must be zero and if you are talking about another operation like or a or b it can be one or another it can be zero because both are zero or it can be one if one of them is different from zero basically when we are saying like zero zero it's false and false zero one false and true okay we won't focus on the element wise logical operations too much but it's just to show that that's possible with julia let me show you an example if I have a vector A with elements one, two, and three, and vector B with all elements equal equals equal two, and I want a vector C that compares each element in A with B and returns to me the, the bit vector in which one says that the element is equal in both vectors what i'm saying is here when you have one it's because the second element in both vectors are the same the the element is the same in both vectors and the other elements are different from each other so you have zero this is useful for linear programming and again for people studying logics and mathematics you can also do that with booleans so leticia uh, am I yes uh, uh, yes i can hear uh, uh, what this period sign do is it like a uh, exclamatory sign in the uh, python something like that that yes. uh, period is equal to is equal to the period is something like uh, not like not operated in uh, python something like that yeah yeah oh, okay. because you were saying that in python you use the exclamation yeah, yeah. to define things yeah. are different yes yeah. uh you re you remind me to explain something in this notation here let's run this cell okay you have equal equal 
B. This will give you a Boolean false because this will analyze the entire list and it will say list A or vector A is different from vector B. So A equals to B is false. When you put the dot, you are doing something called broadcasting, which means that you are evaluating element per element in both lists. And then you have as a return value, a new vector. This broadcasting will always allocate new vectors into your memory because it will analyze and operate element per element. I know that's a complicated concept to say that when you want to analyze element per element, you put the dot before the operator. When you want to analyze the whole data structure, you don't put the dot and then you have, okay, A is not equal to B. Okay, questions? Yeah, got it, thanks. Okay. Great, great. So you can also do that with Booleans. Uh, let's suppose we have X and Y as lists, okay? And we are using the operator called OR. In Julia, the OR operator is this AND so I don't know if there is a specific name for this symbol. If there is, please someone uh, put in the in the chat. I would love to know. But I call it like N. Uh, you will use the dot before this end operator to do the lo logical analysis of both M percent. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So you use this to do the logical operation and you have your vector. Again, you are broadcasting. So you have element per element result. If you remove, that's interesting. If you remove the dot, you have a method error because for this end, operator, you cannot use it alone. So you cannot, you cannot use this operator, this AND operator without the dot, without broadcasting. Um, let me see if there is more comment. Oh, I see. Now, let me put the Mac now here just to separate matrices. So now let's play with matrices. When you have arrays in Python, let's use Python as an example because it's popular. You usually have this one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. So you have this vector. In Julia, you can also use this structure of three element vectors, vectors inside vectors and blah, blah, blah. You can use this, but the proper thing to do with Julia is to use this column dot to separate lines in matrices. And then we have a type matrix, not vector. Vectors are always unidimensional. So you can only have one dimension in a vector. Matrices can be multidimensional. So you have a three times three matrix. You have nine elements here. 
And to do this, you use this column dot and you use the, the brackets. Okay, great. And if you have your list, your vector, and you want to form um, a matrix, matrix out of it, you can do that. You can do that by using the function reshape. So you provide, you provide the vector and you define the dimension. So you can do that. Um, let's see this. I want, I have a vector with nine elements and I want a three times three matrix. That's great. Okay, easy, easy. Let's play with this. Let's have, let's use four, three. So from nine elements, I want a, a matrix with four times three elements. And again, we cannot have that because we have this dimension mismatch. So when you are using the reshape function, you need to be aware that your reshaping needs to be coherent with the size of your vector. Let's give an example. Uh, if I have a vector, let me scroll up. Yes. If I have a vector with 10 elements and I want to do... And I want to make a matrix, matrix with five times two dimensions. I can. I have five lines and two columns. Remember in matrices, lines, columns. Okay, now let's do the inverse. I can also have a matrix with five columns and two lines because it's coherent with my with my with the size of my vector okay but i after reshaping i have this and i want to make this matrix b uh, with the dimension two lines, five columns, a matrix with five lines and two columns. So I only did the transpose. I put this quote, this apostrophe, and then I have the transpose of the matrix. Remember, the transpose is just to invert columns and lines. Um, so yeah, you can do that and you continue to keep the types the same. Now let's test something because we love typing. I will put the number nine in, the, in this vector as a float. What is expected to happen? Again, we have this transformed all into float numbers, which is interesting because we always try to keep the types inside the matrices the same. Okay, great. Let me just drink that. Water. Now, something useful for many different algorithms. Um, usually people form in their machine learning implementations, a big matrix with zeros, and then the values are, are manipulated and added to this matrix. So let's form a matrix of zeros. In Julia, you can do that by defining zeros. 
and then you have your matrix of zeros. But you have a matrix with float zeros, but you want integers. No problem at all. So you call the method zeros, you put integers, and you put the dimensions, five, five, okay? Yes, and then you have a matrix of integers. The same for a matrix of ones. You can have integers, or you can have floats. So, yes, you can have that. Now, forming a matrix of random numbers. You just call ran and give the dimensions. Simple like that. Now, what we will do, and every time you run again, you'll have different random numbers. So, if you're doing Monte Carlo simulation simulations, this is important because basically you form a space, a random space. Uh, and then you will need to use this function to form the, those matrices. Now, let's do the element extraction parsing using Julia. Let me correct this. Element extraction or parsing. Okay, I said that we have a matrix. Let's have this matrix A. Okay, let me just run only the matrix. Okay. And then we want to access the first column. Remember that matrices are defined by lines and columns. To access the first column, I put double dots and this, and then I have the first column. Then one, two, and three. Nice, very nice. Here, when you do this, you can do the same for the lines. So, first line. Yes, you had the first line. Now, look at how interesting is this. I told you that indexing, oops, indexing Julia is from one, not from zero, right? So if you do this, you'll get again the bounds error because we are trying to access from a wrong index. Remember, it's good to remind that. Now, let's do some calculations using two or more matrix. We have matrix A, we have matrix B. And now we want to sum up. If the matrices are from the same dimension, you don't need to broadcast, you just A plus B, because the matrices are from the same dimension. So you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, now, let's try to do a multiplication of the matrix A. Just a reminder. What is matrix A? Matrix A. One, two, three, four. A two times two matrix. If I multiply all the elements by two, I can do that. Um, if I want to multiply, and this is interesting because we were working with 
same dimension matrices here in these operations, right? Two plus two, two plus two. Let's see what happens if I multiply A times one, two. You have a dimension mismatch again. What if I, what if I multiply like this? I have a one column matrix. Let's bring it to be more clear. I have this one, a two element vector, but this is one column. And I have And I have one, two, one row matrix. I can multiply a row a column matrix for this um, to this two times two a matrix because of the matricial operation rules. And then I have this two element vector as an answer. So I can operate over this. I can get the transpose of the matrix, again, putting this apostrophe. And I can concatenate two matrices. Let's print A and let's print B again, okay? So A is one, two, three, four, and B is five, six, seven, eight. If we want to concatenate horizontally, we use the function H N. And then we have C. C. Oh, I see someone with the microphone open. Okay. Uh, so we can concatenate horizontally the C and have the C matrix with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the same matrix. We have now a two times four matrix formed by integers. Great. And now we can also concatenate vertically with V cat. H stands from horizontal and V from vertical. Let's do the transpose of C. C, the transpose of C is different from D. So if you concatenate vertically, you won't get exactly the transpose of C. We will be just literally concatenating. We will have matrix A and matrix B. But here you have this line, this row as a column here, and this row as a column here, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I like this. And you can, again, operate. You can multiply float, float numbers, and so on. Questions so far? Questions are very welcome. Comments before we go to plot. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you just go just uh, up where you have defined the Python syntax like uh, a vector? Uh, the first one, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. 
here yeah so can yeah. we reset so can we reset this to a three cross three matrix reshape Just this like, to a matrix yeah, the, yeah, using the reshape function, or we can just only do that uh, within a single uh, vector like that. In a single vector, did you try? Uh, no, no, I haven't tried. But let's do it. A. You cannot do that. Um. Let's try three, three, because we have the dimension with match. Ah, uh, no. We cannot do that because the reshape function does not access the vectors inside vectors. Yeah, I got it. Access the major, the major vector. So if I have this, you understand? I can have like this matrix three times one. This means this matrix is a row, is a, is a column matrix. I have one column and I, I have three, three rows. This is interesting. This is an interesting case. Uh, let's call this matrix E. Okay. Let's access element e one 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 the first element and now i will create a poll and i want to see what people think will be the output this is an interesting case so output this was a, a very cool interesting question so output for E one one. Is it one? Is it one inside brackets? Or is it one, two, three? Let's launch. Yes. So PQR, it's not, uh, you cannot run before answer. So answer first with your guess. And then we, we run together. I will give more ten seconds before closing. Yeah. Okay, I will close. Let me share the results. Okay, so most of the people think one in brackets. Let's see. The first element in the the first element in the first line and first column is this vector because this matrix has one column and three rows. So if you go this uh, the second the second line first column you will have the second vector if you go to um the third one you will have the third vector and if you put second column you have a bounce error because this element doesn't exist because you don't have a second column. 
let's try to do this. Um, one times three. Let's reshape. We have the inverse. We have a row matrix right now. This is the first element, second element, and third element. So the vector is actually the element. You can store vectors inside matrices. I, I don't do that usually, but if you want to, you are allowed to. <laughs> Just be aware of this when you were manipulating the when you were manipulating the elements. More questions? Was it clear, uh, Aritra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Actually, uh, uh, while listening to the webinar, it's difficult to go back to the code editor and check. So that's why I just asked here. Sorry? Uh, like uh, when I am listening to listening to your talk uh, in the webinar Zoom, so it's difficult to go back to the VS Code and check and go uh, come back. In the meantime, you oh, will I be see. ahead. So th that's why I just asked here. Oh yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, it was a very good question. It's an interesting discussion. Uh, more questions. Okay, so let's move on to the plots. Okay. I won't focus on the theoretical aspects of the particle in a box model, but basically it's a model where you have a given particle in a one dim dimensional box you define the boundaries and when you have the boundaries you have the potential tending to zero and you can have like the infinite potential in the middle you can define different conditions for that here what we are defining we're defining by boundaries as one in atomic units we are defined at 100 points in this space and we are defining a, a range from zero to a with, with length n so we will have a hundred time stamps with space stamps within this range named as x uh i should print this actually let me print this x Yes, so we have this range defined and basically you have the interval between zero and one divided in 100 timestamps. Okay, good. Uh, we can add labels and we have the, we have the wave functions. We can have as many wave functions we want. And this gives the gives origin to to the functions of the molecular orbitals. For example, let's uh, let's first try to define up to three. So if we have three wave functions, we have the normalization uh, constant, just the squared root two divided by A. A is this one. And we have the scene 
of n times pi, and we can define the Greek letter, n times pi times x divided by a. Great. And then we add this result in the wave functions vector, and we add a label saying n is one, is two, or is three. We add this to the labels. And then we have our wave functions. To plot this, you initialize a plot environment with nothing as argument. And then inside of the plot function with an exclamation, you put x as an x, the wave function as your y. In your label, you define as your reshaped labels uh, a vector. You need to reshape your vector into a matrix. I will write this, reshaping vector into a matrix to be your label. Okay, great. And then you have this. You define the title, X and Y label. And this is what your plot looks like. Okay, great. But let's play with this plot a little bit. Before we go back to this plot, I just want to show how flexible is this environment before we go in detail into one plot implementation. Uh, oh, I didn't say, but you need to have the plots library. For people that don't remember, uh, let's open a new cell. I already have it installed. If you don't, remember in Julia, our first class, PKG add plots. That's it. And then you call using plots. I won't run this because I already have plots installed. So I don't need it. Once you are using plots, you can plot whatever you want. Let's plot something from scratch. Um, let's define a function, a mathematical function, fx, and this is a squared. Okay, great. Once you define this function, fx, your i can be a vector where, and now we will practice the inline notations. Your axis, your y axis can be f e. For e so I see a comment. Oh, okay, Jordania. Let's go back to that. In Julia. When we want to use libraries or packages, we need to use the package, what is called package manager. In Python, when you want to plot, you use matplotlib, right? You do this, import. But you need to first install pip, install matplotlib. Right? In Julia, you don't need to do that. 
you need to call the package manager, PKG. Once you called the PKG, you install by doing this, plots, pkg.add plots. And then to use plots after you install, you run this using plots. This is the default procedure to install and use and import packages in Julia. So before you run the plots library, you need to do this if you don't have that installed in your computer. Okay, is it clear now, Jordania? Okay, great, nice. Please feel free to ask more questions. Uh, so going back to our hands-on example, we have this inline function, and then we define the y values because in a plot, we always have x-axis and y-axis in the Cartesian space. Great. Perfect. For y, we have f f i for i in 1 to 10. And then we can define an interval in 100, um, 100 uh, points. OK. Oh, I actually defined 1 to 100 in, yes. Okay, let's have then. Okay, oh, let's have more. Okay, let's have 100 points. Our plot will be prettier. So we have one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, up to a hundred squared. We have this as our y uh, values, okay? Now it's quite easy. We have the plot library called. We can do x, actually to have an x vector let's do this we have the y we have the function we have the y and we have the x the x is all the numbers from one up to 100 just to recall okay i have a hundred element vector and then I call the function plot x, y. Okay, great. I have this profile. But I want to add features to this plot. So I want to make the line thicker. I can change a line width by defining line, line width inside the plot function. And then I have a wider, uh, thicker line. Great. I want to add um, label. Because here you just see y1 but i want to add a label x is squared that's the function 
Okay, but I want to make this better, right? So I can do this. I can do latex-like notation in here. And wait. You do this. And you put $1. I actually don't need a dollar. Um, instead of doing this, I will just. Type. Two, yes, got it, perfect. So now I could do the, the latex line notation. What you need to do, just recalling, <laughs> uh, bar, and then you put the squared symbol and two. And then you need to press tab in your keyboard, done, okay, great. So now we have the proper label, but we still want to put the color. We want to change this color. We use the argument line color and we can define whatever color we want. Great. I don't like this font, so I will change the font to Helvetica. Helvetica. See, now I have another font. I want to. Add a title. Let's see. Practice plot with F of X equals two squared x great i want to add a label in the x axis x label is x and y label is y i have the label so here i'm showing how many things you can do with these plots in julia now, let's add another function, but now the function we want to add, let's call g, g of x. g of u, not x, just to change the name of the variable. We have the cube. We have u powered by three. Okay. Let me just remove this. Okay. So now what we are going to do, we define v, v is a new vector where the elements are g of i for i in one up to 100. And then we have a 100 element vector with cube and we have the values form u 
we don't need to have values for u actually because those are the same values for x so you're actually going to use x and now we want to add this function to that same plot what we do we just call plot and we put put an exclamation in julia every time you put this exclamation you are adding a layer into your original plot so you're doing like um accumulated plots if you do just this you'll have one line but if you do this oh now i need to run this again this yes so now we have the cube and we have the squared here. Now let's do the same, but for just the last one. Part by four. And now W questions P yes and we put green yes so here is what we see we have the labels we have the lines with different colors, we have the x values, and we have this y axis showing how the different functions rules. And we can see that as the exponent grows, like this becomes very way, way large, larger than the previous functions. That's quite impressive really cool so he, here is the how you can add new plots to this you put the exclamation and you add new plots great and here in the comments when you when you see that in the notebook when you upload you can have you can try to uncomment this and play around with that comment uh, session of the plots. Here, let's go back to our main plot. I showed step by step how you manipulate. Now, I will make a new poll and I will ask. Oops, we sharing. I will ask, what do we need to do to make these lines thicker? Now we will make this plot prettier. Um, let's open a new poll. Thicker plot line. What's the argument? Line with. Oops. Do not write. Right. No. Oh, God. Okay. Now I think it's yes. Great. Uh, okay, save, and I will launch. 
And then you tell me what's the argument to make these lines thicker. I will give ten more seconds. Oh my God, you guys are great. <laughs> I will end the poll, like everybody pretty much got it right. Great. I like to show this because plots are always very important. So line with three. Yes, we have thicker lines. Now, Oh, okay. I've closed the, the poll already. Sorry, Arita. I closed the, it was pretty quick. I will, I will make sure in the next one I will leave for more time. Okay, sorry. Now, let's let's change the font let's put the font family as helvetica yes helvetica beautiful now uh, let's try new colors so What colors do we have? We have orange, green, and blue. Let's try colors. <laughs> Red, green, and blue. Just let me double check. Yeah. Okay, let's change the color, the colors of the lines to this. Now we call colors, color equals to colors. Yes. <laughs> so the thing is, when you call the colors, you need to have a matrix, not a vector. If you have a vector, it will be a bit messy. See? A lot of warnings and this weird, weird line, like red. And you will see like red, green, and blue in the same line. But if you have this if you have a vector of colors if you have a matrix of colors i like to play around with this you see like errors and try to fix and make it better so here we have red green and blue and we have the lines and we can play around with the order so for n1 we will have red n2 green and three blue but we can change the word order for whatever order we want. <coughs> Sorry. You can also define the position of the legend. The legend is this box. So we can define to have it top left, bottom left, bottom right 
bottom right and top right. Whatever is more convenient for visualization, for better visualization. Now let's put more six. Now put more colors, orange, purple, and black. I reshape. Reshape. Let's see. Yes, now we have from one to six, and we can see the spherical harmonics and oh, that's nice. Like the wave functions. That's that's nice. You can play around and put as many functions you want. It's quite cool. Now, uh, question so far, before we go to our exercise and practice. Okay, great. Let's go to our exercise three. This is cool. So let's work with the Michaelis Menten reaction with the catalyst package. The same way this uh, Jordania, as I explained and showed earlier, you will do the same here to install the catalyst package. Use PKG, PKG add, catalyst, and then using catalyst. The name of the package is catalyst. It allows you to do a bunch of different things with chemical reactions. Let's define uh, Michaelis Menten reaction. Michaelis Menten. Kinetics. This is just educational purpose. So let's go to yes. So here we have the Michaelis Menten kinetics showing for enzyme catalyzed reactions um basically you define the the equation for the reaction rate and if you i will leave i will leave this link there i won't go through specifics but the example we are going to do is this one with fumarase marazi um and i will leave this link there in the notebook if you want to go into more detail to the michaelis main thing because the focus is not to discuss the the michaelis main thing uh let me leave this link here michaelis main thing for people that work with uh, enzymes and biological reactions, this is very cool. Great. Yes, here is the link. When I upload this notebook in the GitHub, you'll see that. So using the catalyst package, you will have access to the reaction network macro. And then you call this reaction network and you begin and you have, you define the rate constant and you define the reaction. Once you do that, you finalize with end and then you have this. It will show up as a LaTeX notation for your reaction. 
And for the Michaelis Menten condition, we'll have the equilibrium reaction and the fast reaction. So you have this profile. Let's try a simple reaction just to show real time how to deal with this macro. You define a variable like simple reaction. And then we have, oh, this is in markdown. Let's change to Julia, yes. You have reaction network. And then you define begin. With begin, you can define the rate constant one, X forming Y, and, okay, you have this, you have X forming Y and you have the rate constant. Once you do that, you take simple, reaction you can put i think in get the list you have this reaction reaction function yes you have the reactions function you define the network and you can take this network into a vector with the reactions you are studying by doing this using the function reactions. This allows you to do many things for microkinetic simulations because for each element, you can define a specific concentration and a specific value for the rate constant. And I will show this for the Michaelis Menten situation. As many reactions you put in the reaction network, you will have access inside your vector. And see, multiple dispatch being used here. In this package, they created a type called reaction. So you see that the concepts we learn in the first class are being applied all the time in the Julia environments and Julia packages and libraries, which is great. It's interesting. Okay, let's go back to our Michaelis Menten situation. Um, here, after you define the reaction network, and you have C1, C2, C3, and you have the reactions. Remember, these ones are the rate constants. So you can come here, define the parameters, and define the values. Remember, we are taking the results for the data for, for fumarase. C1, C2, and C3, you define the values for the three reactions. You define the time span from zero to 100 seconds, for example, and you define initial conditions. In this case, we define the concentration of the species, S, E, S, E, and P. And these species are generic because once you form the reaction network, the species inside the reaction network are generic. And then you can attribute concentrations to, to it. Coming back to this, when you run, you see that this is being formed. S and E, as expected, are reactants. They have a given concentration. The products S, E, and P start with zero concentration because it's a chemical reaction. So 
the products have no concentration at the beginning of the process. Okay, okay, great. Questions so far? Okay, so now remember that rate laws are ordinary differential equations. And in Julia, we can solve this differential equation by calling the ODE problem. And to solve this, it's quite simple because you give the reaction. The reaction is called RS because I gave the name RS to the variable. The initial concentrations, the time span, and the parameters with the rate constants. I call the solve function for this ODE problem, for this uh, ordinary differential equation. And I use um, um, ODE solver. This is a numerical solver for differential equations. Where is that? Okay, great. But you don't need to specify. If you specify, it will still run. If you don't specify, it will still run. But if you specify the one you want, you probably get a more accurate result. This solver is good for stiff problems like rate, loss, this one. This is also implemented already in Julia, so nothing to worry about. Red code success, and then it solved the differential equation for the given timestamp. Perfect. And here I'm installing the differential equations package following the same procedure as always, pkg.add. This is in the notebook. So you, you just repeat the process and then you use. Uh, this is showing the same problem with another solver. A steepest descent solver. You still have that working. And then you call plots. And after calling plots, we do the same thing we are used to already. We put the results, we put the title, we define the line width, we define the labels, and then we run and we have the plots for the kinetic simulations and now i want to give a small homework um take this notebook and i will upload this notebook now exercise three Loading to GitHub. Yes, great. So the homework. Test this to different rate constants and see what changes in the profile. Test the initial test different initial conditions and try your own reaction network. So you can use the same notebook and just add more cells. Uh, that is, that's fine. And another homework, install the DFTK package that we will use tomorrow. DFTK package is for density functional calculations. And we will play with that tomorrow. 
vent gaps. People that work with solid state will love this package for their research and everything. If you work with kinetics, you got a lot of information today. And if you work with DFT, plane waves for solid state, you love this DFTK package. So install this for tomorrow, and I tomorrow will be working with DFTK. And after that, we will use the machine learning and artificial intelligence packages. Okay, questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> Let me stop sharing and see. Yes, for Pamela, yes, you can use you can use special characters in in labels. Good question. Hi, I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, like uh, we can define a uh, not for, not from today's class. It's basically from class one. You can say. So we have a, a, a hierarchy in the like a integer of sixteen, integer thirty two, integer sixty four, like that, right? Yes. So how can uh, how can I uh, define that? Okay. I need integer 64 or I need integer 16, let's say, because I know uh, I, I will not need more than, uh, it really will not be a very large number, so I can take integer 16. But how can uh, I say that? Whether there is any range for specific type? So let me see if I understood your question correctly. What you were asking me is for example in a vector if you want to limit the vector to use integer uh no 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 or if you want to round a float into an integer uh no uh actually uh uh, uh in this uh in the types there are types hierarchy right integer 16 32 or integer 64 yes. so these are for bits like space uh, memory yes. allocations exactly so, uh, how can i specify that okay let's say i have the integer like 10 so i guess it can be fixed into the integer 16 so is there any range so that i can define because if I don't have a bigger number, then I can uh, put it in a integer 16. If I have larger number like 1 million, then I can put it in integer 64. So there is, is there a range for, for that? Um, yes. When you want to do that for a specific number, it depends on the package you are using and the functions you are providing. You cannot do that for one number isolated. But, for example, function uh, test, okay? Number n, integer 16, print n. As it's in if. If, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Myopia, sorry for that. <laughs> and then you call this function test. For this specific number, you cannot, you can try to parse and have like integer 16. For this, but you cannot do that for isolated. Okay. So let's let's assume I am building a package. So right. is there any definition like uh, 
yes from what range to what i can uh, define integer 16 or from what to range from what uh, i can define integer 32 or later on integer 64. to accept every type of integers you do this where t is a subtype of integer this super type integer accepts int 16 32 and 64. So for this function, you'll now be able to overcome this error. This. And here you have this. For lists, you can do this uh, integer 64. integer 64 yes you can do this for your list and then you define that all the elements in your list needs to be this integer 16 integer whatever integer 32 and then we specify the type does it make sense yeah somewhat yeah Okay, okay, great. It's a great question. Someone else? And, uh, this DFTK is for uh, the exercise two actually, or it is for the exercise four? Sorry? Uh, there was actually another uh, exercise which actually uh, i didn't understand uh it's regarding linear uh, it's using the linear algebra package oh this one the the stoichiometric matrix I, uh, so oh. can you explain what is the question so that i can work on it oh yes i, I will i will understand. actually this is I will update this for for tomorrow, but because we will do more stuff on this, but basically you take this reaction and the idea is to create a function that creates this stoichiometric matrix automatically by taking this reaction as a reaction network. So what you will actually do, let me show you. Uh, let me put mark down because I won't run. But yeah, you can start working on it. That will, that will be great to practice today's class. Reaction network, begin. You define the rate constant. And you define a reaction. And from this, you define a function that takes a reaction network and returns the stoichiometric coefficients in a matrix. That's the idea of the exercise. So these will be your product, like your outcome of the function. Okay. So we have to use that same package. Yes. Let me just copy. Yay. Great. Okay, enter. Yes. So here is the, the idea of the problem. I got it. Actually, I, I was thinking that it was based on the previous day's uh, topic. So. Oh, yeah, the, the exercise from yesterday, right? The exercise one. Yeah. I was thinking yeah, no, that no. it was based on these, so 
I tried, but I couldn't understand what he did. Yeah, my bad. It's because I I needed to update this one that I would I would update after the after introducing the catalyst package. Yeah, if we could just uh, upload this uh, this uh, up then it will yeah. be it. Oh, thanks. Date exercise two. Great. Okay. More questions? Great discussions today. Okay, so see, I will see everybody tomorrow. Um, if you have questions, please reach out. You can open the issues on GitHub. Uh, I'm willing to help everybody. Uh, Wallison, did you get your environment to work? Oh, great. Awesome. So I think everybody, I think everybody has the environment working. Okay, see you everybody tomorrow. I will stop the recording and I will uh, send the recording today. <laughs>